Hello and welcome everyone to my session for the Data and DI Summit 2022 about um, deep dive into Delta Lake. Before we get started, um, let me also introduce myself so that you know that um, who's speaking and, and who's giving you all this information. So my name is Gerd Brücker. I work for a company called Pico where we focus on building AI and analytics platforms for um, our customers, usually on the Microsoft Azure platform. And um, I also share most of my um, knowledge via my blog um, and also um, provide some um, free open source third party tools for um, Databricks and also Delta Lake. Especially for the Delta Lake, um, I'm responsible for the Power BI connector. So if you ever uh, wanted or needed to connect uh, your data from Databricks to Power BI, you can also have um, a look at the other session about um, Databricks meets Power BI that I also did for a Data and AI Summit. Okay, so let's get started. I prepared a, a little agenda um, on what, what we're going to cover in the next um, in the next hour or next 40 minutes. Basically, have a quick look what Delta Lake actually is and then um, have some details on the Delta Log, which is obviously very important for the Delta Lake um, architecture. And also, I'll, I'll show you um, and, and some brief examples how this actually works and, and what happens under the hood if you, if you perform um, some of the most common um, transactions on a, on a Delta Lake table. Um, we will cover file and storage management as this is very crucial um, for Delta Lakes. And we'll also have a look at streaming um, use cases and what you need to watch out for um, when you use Delta Lake for streaming. And um, the last um, technical thing that we'll cover are um, table properties and properties that you can set in, in Spark or on the table itself to control how um, Delta works internally. And at the end, I've prepared some um, conclusions and lessons learned. So what is Delta Lake? Um, Delta Lake is basically an open source um, storage format that you can use to store your data. It's compatible with most of the um, common processing engines for big data uh, for most Spark, but also with others like Hive and Trino, Flink and so on. What's also very important um, and, and makes it very usable across different um, um, people and skill sets is that it, there are different APIs for most of the common languages um, being Python, Scala, um, and also for Ruby and Rust, for example. Um, the, the key features of, of Delta Lake um, is actually um, a, that it is um, ACID compliant in terms of transactions, meaning that whenever you um, do a transaction or run a transaction on your Delta Lake table, being like an insert, update, delete, whatever, um, Delta Lake or the Delta Lake protocol basically ensures that this transaction is either done completely or not at all. So you'll basically never end up in a state where um, where your transaction is only um, executed halfway and then it aborts. So that can never happen and the data is actually always in a consistent state. Um, some other features uh, which are actually very important because it makes the Delta Lake um, very usable is the support for update and merge. If you have used um, Hive in the in the very beginnings, or um, you probably know that updating data is actually not that simple. Um, if you do it row by row, um, and Delta Lake really uh, helps here, especially using the merge statement, which provides a lot of, of cool features that you can use to easily manage your data. Um, on top of the um, transaction um, protocol, there is some features that are, are built um, for most time travel. So as each transaction is basically um, recorded in, in the Delta log that we will cover later, you can basically always jump back to previous version of your table and the data in your table. There's also other features for, um, for schema, schema evolution and schema, schema enforcement. So it's actually not possible to add um, data in a wrong schema to your to an existing delta table so that that transaction would just fail if you try to i don't know like insert a string value into an integer column for example um however you do have um schema evolution uh, which which allows you to um change or extend um the an existing delta table on the fly assuming um it's within supported um operations, so upcasts, for example, from small int to big int. 
Um, also, Delta Lake supports both batch and streaming, which is also very important because um, you can actually maintain the same code for your batch processing and also for stream processing. And it's also 100% compatible with Apache Spark. So um, when it now comes to the, to the actual implementation, uh, what you will get when you actually create the Delta table is um, it's basically a folder that contains the metadata, the transaction log, the delta log that we will cover later, and obviously also the data itself. Um, but this this folder in itself is um, is more or less like self-contained, so you can just take that folder, put it on a USB key, and open it from there if you want. It's not it's not actually tied to any um, file system or a storage system. You can just place it anywhere. Obviously, it makes the most sense in in a data lake. And um, but as I said, it's it's not mandatory. Mandatory. As the Delta Lake um, table contains all the data that it needs to to operate um, in itself in that folder. Um, anyone who ever wants to work with the Delta table just needs to know the location. So, for example, if you have a Delta label uh, table in your in your data lake and you have like a Spark cluster that needs to process it, you can just um, tell Spark that the path of the delta table, and then you can just read it as a regular data frame. You don't need to specify the schema. You don't need to specify anything else. Um, it's all handled automatically for you. So that's that's pretty convenient. So how is this all possible? As I said, um, there is um, the, the, the key concept of Delta Lake is actually a transaction layer on top of the, of the actual data. And this transaction layer is called the Delta Log. So this delta log is also stored as part of, of, the, um, of the delta lake table in a, in a special folder called underscore delta underscore log. And it basically contains um, everything that, that's important to manage the transactions and, and keep the um, and, yeah, keep the data the table and metadata up to date. So it is the delta log foremost contains the table schema obviously and all the changes so if there is an like a new column is added then that's also recorded there it also contains the references to all the actual files that contain the data and um, with every operation and transaction that you run on the delta table it also stores some additional metadata and metrics for each transaction that you do as you can see on the right um, those transactions in the delta log are actually stored as JSON files and after 10 transactions, a so-called checkpoint file is generated, um, which basically contains all the previous transactions and um, aggregates it into one um, big parquet file. Reason for that is that, um, as you can imagine, if you have a table that's um, out there for a couple of years and you have a lot of transactions there, it would cause, I don't know, like millions of JSON files and obviously reading those JSON files um, would be a big hassle because you would have to touch, let's say, a million JSON files. So um, to avoid this, those checkpoints were introduced, and basically what you need to do is just like lead, read the latest checkpoint and everything, all the JSON transactions from there on. So it, um, it's a maximum of 11 files, actually. <coughs> this, um, the, the, the Delta log further allows um, this, this ACID compliant features for um, concurrency control. So if, if multiple um, processes are basically updating the same um, Delta table at the same time, um, one of them will fail uh, because um, it would not be consistent anymore. If, if you, for example, update data that's also updated by, by another process, the output would not be the same or not what you expect. So um, that's why one of those transactions would fail, and that's so-called optimistic concurrency control. So basically, whenever um, you commit it, or before the, the process actually commits the transaction, it basically checks whether um, the, the data has changed since um, it was since the transaction was started. If that's the case, the transaction will fail. Um, and yeah, the delta log is is used for time travel. So um, you see all those different versions on the right side. You can basically say, OK, please show me the table as it was in version 007, for example. Um, and it, it will return the data um, as it was back then. Also, um, for streaming, as every transaction um, is, is, um, is logged in the Delta log, we can also use this information for streaming and process um, 
the data as it was changed or added in order um, for, for our streaming pipelines. Um, there is a neat command which is called describe history, which you can um, run on your, on your delta table, and it will basically give you all the information um, that currently exists in, in this delta log. Okay, you see like the version, the timestamp, when it was changed, user ID, username, the actual operation, and there are a lot of other um, columns there that provide even more information. Um, just to have a look, um, I just wanted to, to show you that um, you actually um, find all this information in a, in a easy to use way. Um, so that also helps a lot when you're actually debugging. Uh, when you're actually debugging some um, some ETL pipelines and wondering what's actually happened to your Delta tables, just have a look at the, at the history and you very likely see a lot of, um, get a lot of information from there. So what actually happens when I run a query against the Delta Lake table? So with all the information that we already have with the Delta log and the checkpoints, the first thing that it needs to do, um, it needs to read the Delta log. Um, if we do have um, this checkpoint file, um, there is an additional file created automatically, which is called underscore last underscore checkpoint, that allows you to immediately um, jump to the most recent checkpoint file. Um, once you read the checkpoint file, um, you already have most of the, of the transactions in there. And if there are any transaction after the checkpoint file, um, the, the processor would also need to read all following JSON files. As we create the checkpoint file, um, every by default, every after every ten transactions, it only has to read a maximum of, of, of those of ten JSON files in addition to the checkpoint file. Um, once the um, the delta log is read, um, the the engine basically um, receives all the the files that belong to that state or to the latest state of the delta table, which are basically parquet files, reads them and um, well returns the results to the caller. So that's how a query is, is, is processed um, on top of a Delta Lake table. So how does the Delta Lake work and how does the, um, the transaction, the Delta logs and the actual store um, data files um, are, are persisted in, in the Data Lake? So let's uh, take this very simple example. We have a, a, a table with three rows. Um, it was created as a Delta table. So we have one transaction in the Delta log folder. And then in the tr that transaction basically added one file, which is the part 01 parquet file that contains three rows. If I now run an update on that table where I set the price for my PC to 1300, um, what actually happens is um, it first of all creates the new file in the storage which is another three rows, and it creates a new delta log transaction, 0001 and dot JSON in this case. And within that transaction, speci basically specified that the old parquet file is logically removed and a new parquet file is added. Okay. So that's what it looks like after the update. So what happens if I delete a row? So if I run a delete from the product where the product equals PC, um, it might be a bit counterintuitive because we're actually deleting some file, some some rows. Um, but what happens is that it still creates a new parquet file. It only has two rows though, but it still um, adds um, adds files even though I'm running a delete, which is a bit counterintuitive, right? And again, um, the the delta log entry, like the JSON file, contains a remove entry for the um, the previous uh, parquet file and a new add entry for the new parquet file that now only contains those two rows. For an insert, um, it's slightly different um, because for an insert we don't actually have to remove something because like um, the, the 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 Spark engine that reads the Delta table or the consumer in general um, basically always has to read all the parquet files that are in the in the in the um, in the current Delta table and belong to the latest version. So we can simply add a new file. So in this case, uh, we add one row um, and we also add, and well, the Delta um, Delta Lake engine adds one parquet file with one row. So that's that's pretty straightforward and should give you like a, a, a quick overview of what, what each transaction causes in the Delta log and also on the storage. 
Um, as you have seen, like even if we um, delete files, um, the files still um, reside on the storage. So um, basically each transaction can potentially create a new file. An insert or an update obviously always create new files, um, whereas even a delete can create new files. Okay, and as you can imagine, if you do a lot of transactions and touch a lot of different files, um, this can um, create a lot of files in your storage. It can be millions, um, well, very much depends on your use case and your table. Um, but I, 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 get, I guess you get the point. So how to deal with, with this issue or, or with this amount of files? Um, which leads us to the, to the next um, big part, which is file and storage management. Um, also, Delta Lake provides um, some built-in um, functions that um, allow us to, to do the file and storage management. One of them is vacuum. Um, so if I run um, this, this specific vacuum command, um, it's actually not changing the data itself, as you can see on the right side. So the table at the top on the left side is the very same as the table on the right side. Um, but what happens is that um, it's actually cleaning up our storage. So as you can see at the very bottom, the first and the second parquet file are actually physically removed. So before they were only logically removed um, due to the delete statement or to the update statement. And now once we run the vacuum command, it's actually physically deleting um, those files and also um, making the, the storage free and um, so we don't have to pay for it anymore. Also, the vacuum um, transaction is locked in the in the delta lock. Um, there is a specific operation called vacuum start and vacuum end. They have just been, well, not recently, but like a couple of months ago, added, um, so that you also um, keep track of that and know when the table is actually vacuumed in the delta lock history. Okay, the second command that I want to mention here is so-called optimize. Um, optimize basically. Um, consolidates smaller files um, into larger files. So a pain point for most big data processing engines is that if you have um, a very large amount of very small files, the metadata overhead of reading those single files um, can, can um, be a potential bottleneck. So Delta Lake introduces optimized command that basically um, consolidates um, small files, like two rows and one row, into a new file um, that contains all the rows. It's a very simple example here, but just that you get the point um, for, for optimize. So again, um, the data is, as you can see in the, in the transaction, we remove two files logically and add a new one. But on the storage, we now um, have again um, the data twice, even though basically nothing changed, right? So the result is still the very same. <coughs> So what does vacuum do? Um, as I said, it, it basically physically um, removes the files from the actual storage. Um, it's a bit more complicated um, that, than I've shown in the example, um, because it's not removing all files, but only files that have been deleted at least X days or hours ago, so um, that have been outdated for longer than a, uh, than a given period. Um, you can basically run vacuum whenever you want. Um, it will never have effect on the on the on the most recent version of the delta table. Um, what you need to keep in mind, though, is once you remove the physical files, um, you obviously cannot use time travel anymore and go back to um, let's say the table as it was seven or ten days ago. If you ran vacuum with a retention period of five days because then everything that's older than that has been deleted more than five days ago um, is also physically removed. You will get an error message there saying that, um, well, the actual file doesn't exist anymore. For optimize, uh, as I mentioned, it basically um, collapses small files into bigger files, but there are also some other um, features, which is mainly set ordering, which is some kind of clustering and ordering of the data which allows um, for, for better file, file and actually also partition pruning. And optimize is, well, as the, as the name implies, um, mainly used to optimize query performance. 
so that you don't have this overhead of small um, of the small files, but can ideally read files that have already one gigabyte or um, an, an amount of or a size that that's that's good for for your processing engine to consume, which is usually between two hundred and fifty megabytes and one gigabyte. Okay, some um, some um, additional informations for vacuum and optimize. Um, so vacuum has also um, have a a dry run um, parameter which just tells you okay which files it would remove. The issue with the current implementation of vacuum is that it well it would show you like a thousand files that would potentially be deleted if you run the actual vacuum command, but you don't know how many files there are in total. And so it could be a thousand and one file, but it could also be a hundred thousand files. So you, you don't know. A, a little um, trick that you can use is if you if you execute um, the vacuum command in a Scala notebook or in a Scala cell, it actually um, prints out the number of files that it that it would delete, which is not the case if you run the very same statement in, in Python or in SQL, for example. One thing to keep in mind when you run a vacuum is that um, it can take a very uh, long time. So we had cases at customers where we were basically deleting a couple of million files, I think it was like 30 million, and the job ran for, I don't know, like a week. Uh, main reason for that was is that um, the deletion was actually like a single threaded operation running on the driver only, and it didn't really leverage um, the, the, the whole cluster and didn't distribute the load. So that's just something that you um, should be aware of, but I guess this will also be fixed in the in the future. For optimize, I already mentioned that it actually duplicates the data, creates another copy, an optimized copy. And um, also what may be important for you, um, you can run and optimize on a partition level, which means um, you can also use different set ordering for different partitions. Um, if you know that that particular partition is is queried or has like different um, query patterns. Two more um, functions or, or features for, for data management are restore and clone. So as we do have all those um, transactions locked in the Delta log, there is also an easy way to um, basically restore um, a Delta table to a previous version or to a previous state. So you can just run restore um, the table to um, timestamp as off and then specify the date and it will basically um, recreate the table as it was at that timestamp and from now on after the, the restore command finished um, that's your latest state of the table. This can be very useful if you accidentally for example delete the data or accidentally did some um, ET or ransom ETL or data pipelines that modify the data and um, you're actually not happy with the output, you can just restore the previous version. That's actually super convenient. And um, what, what, uh, what's also nice about it is it, it doesn't really copy any data, it's just like a metadata only operation and just um, points um, or yeah, makes your Delta, Delta Lake table point to a different version of the of the files. But um, also the um, the restore operation creates a new version. Okay, it will also be logged in the in the delta log, which is quite good actually. The second um, function clone is also very important, especially for testing. So clone basically allows you to to clone an existing delta lake table into a under, or into a different path. So you can have um, there's two options. You can use a shallow clone or a deep clone. Um, a shallow clone basically just copies the delta log or forks the delta log. And um, every operation that you um, that you run on top of the of the of the shallow clone will actually not touch the old or the original um, table anymore, but it will just touch your shallow clone and um, do all the changes there. So if you, if you want to to test um, some some um, data pipeline. The safest way is probably to just um, run it on a sh or create a shallow clone up front and then run the pipeline on that shallow clone. Um, another option is so-called um, deep clone, and 
in addition to the actual delta log that is copied, it also copies all the data files. So um, you need to be aware um, if you have like a big table with a couple of terabytes, it will actually copy the whole table and um, yeah, it again, take, can take some time. As I mentioned here, it's it's ideal for testing. It's actually super convenient and yeah, and the syntax is pretty simple. So you can just create table, events clone, shallow clone events. As the, especially the shallow clone is just a metadata operation that usually executes in a couple of seconds. Okay, some additional information about um, restore and clone. So um, you can run a restore as often as you want. So as I mentioned, like restore also creates a new version in, in the delta log table. And if you, for example, are not happy with your restore and you want to um, go back to the original version, you can restore the restored version, basically. Um, yeah, that, that, that's just um, nice to know. And um, as I mentioned before already, it doesn't create any new data files. It's just a metadata operation. So you cannot really break anything there. Um, Regarding clones, um, one very important feature, especially about deep clones, is that they can be incremental. So if you run a um, create or replace um, deep clone um, command, it will actually um, do incremental incremental updates to your um, to your clone, which is super convenient and can be used, for example, for backups. So if you want to back up a Delta Lake table. Um, using deep clones or incremental deep clones is actually a very good solution and very efficient because it um, you don't need to scan um, don't need to scan the storage and everything can basically done using the delta log only so that that's that's really convenient okay um, as you have been working uh, with big data already I guess partitioning um, you are familiar with partitioning. Anyways, I want to, to cover briefly what we want to achieve um, when, when we create partitions for our delta tables. So basically, we, we partition our data so um, that our file, either our file management is easier or our query performance is, is better. Um, especially for the, the lower layers being bronze and silver, usually the data, the, 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 the tables are partitioned for ETL performance. So ideally, if you load data from um, into bronze, um, the data that you load matches exactly one partition. So usually, for example, if you get a daily um, export from from your source system, you would usually create one one um, partition per day when when you receive an export. For silver, um, that's usually similar, and ideally, um, you can just use the same partitioning concept as on bronze because then you can just copy or reload um, silver very easily by just replacing what's in that one partition and re and reload it from bronze with for example a new processing logic um, but this again like very much depends on your use case and whether that's actually um, possible for gold um, which is usually designed towards query performance, so end users query goal and performance should be um, your main priority, um, which means that your partitioning can can vary. So, um, for example, if you um, if you receive data in on a daily basis um, on bronze and silver and process it there, and the data, for example, contains a start date. Um, that is not aligned with the partition. So you can receive data today, uh, which has a start date from, I don't know, like last year, for example. And um, if users usually query by this start date column, it's 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 a good idea to to change the partition in gold to um, to use that start date column. Because then every query that uses the start date can already be um, can already be filtered down to the partitions that actually contain the data without having to to read and scan the whole table which obviously is very time consuming in general um the the the, the overall idea is to touch as few partitions as possible um, or as necessary uh, because the less you touch the, the faster your um your operation will be regardless whether it's an etl um, operation or um, a query operation as I said, um, ETL and query um, requirements can 
can conflict. Um, in this, this case, you um, you need to change um, the partitioning, as I said, like from silver to gold. Um, that's just something um, that you need to keep in mind. Changing partitioning um, can be very um, complicated and resource intensive because potentially every new um, batch um, that you load from silver um, can can update every partition could can potentially update or change any partition on gold. Okay, so we had cases where um, like loading one batch basically has rewritten the whole gold table, and as you can imagine, that's not really um, yeah efficient in terms of um, in terms of uh, processing time and also in terms of storage. As we know that whenever we run a, an update or a merge. Um, it's actually copying the data, and if we if we touch the old partitions of the gold table, we basically copy all the data again, thereby um, consuming twice the amount of storage that the actual table um, would need. Um, to make um, your queries more efficient and also your your ETL, um, it's advisable to always explicitly specify the partitioning columns. When you, um, for example, merge into a table, or um, well, obviously delete it, delete data, or also if you if, um, uh, select data. Um, as you can already see and, and and know based on the example that I've given you, um, a good candidate for partitioning partitioning is usually time, um, but it again very much depends on your use case. Let's say 95% of the of the Delta Lake tables that I've seen, we at some point have partitioned by time, whether it's arrival time of the data in bronze and silver or some event time or start time in gold. Um, it's usually really related to time. And depending on your requirements and your data, you can add additional um, columns for, for your partitioning. And um, things to keep in mind, if you have um, too many partitions, you again um, potentially run into troubles of having um, a, a large overhead of, of reading all the metadata. Okay, so that's also something that you uh, would like to avoid. So as a, as a rule of thumb, um, you should you should have a few thousand partitions at a maximum, and ideally um, a single partition should be one gigabyte or bigger than one gigabyte. So it doesn't make sense to have a partition that's only one megabyte. Um, yeah. However, um, it very, very, very much depends on, on your data, on the distribution of your data, on your um, query query patterns, on your ETL patterns, and so on. Um, yeah, so just evaluate it on uh, um, each case um, whenever you create a new table, what the, the, the best partition scheme uh, would be for you. Another thing that I need to mention um, is um, so-called generated columns, so Delta Lake, since um, some months um, have a feature called generated columns, which basically allow you to derive um, to, well to derive data from existing columns and persist it in, in 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 new columns. So, for example, where it is used very often is for if you have like an event timestamp column, and um, you would need to partition the the table by the date of the event timestamp or the year of the, of the event timestamp, you can use a generated column that basically extracts this information from the timestamp column and populates it automatically. Um, the cool thing about this is if you follow that approach, it's actually, so the Delta engine um, will also try to, to push the filters that you have, for example, on a query, um, also down to the partition. So, if you um, if you have a setup like this, where you have like this event stamp um, generated, um, or just this um, event date column um, generated based on the event timestamp, and you run a query select star from my table where event date equals I don't know, um, 27th of June 2022, then it will basically um, push down that automatically for you. Even if you if you create specific more specific filters on the on the original event timestamp column, this will also be pushed down to um, to the to the actual partitions, which makes your queries much more efficient. Um, there are some um, some functions that can be pushed. Some others can't. Um, I included the link here 
um, which ones those are. So if you're not sure, just have a look there. <clears throat> um, some specifics about Delta and partitions. Um, as we know, um, or as I mentioned, um, Delta Lake um, supports transactions and also supports multiple um, updates at the same time. As long as um, each of the updates only touches a specific partition. So you can have 10 concurrent um, updates if each of those updates um, jobs only touches one single partition and those are not overlapping, then that's just fine because Delta will manage it. So um, make sure that you that you always specify those partitions when you, for example, run a merge. This can also speed up um, the merge process itself because it, it already knows in advance which partitions to scan for changes. Because otherwise, if you do not specify um, the partitions in the target, it will actually scan the whole um, target table. If you want to know um, if your um, if your partition filters um, have actually been used in, for example, a merge statement, you can um, check the delta log history and search for the query predicates that have been used when um, when running the merge statement. And ideally, you show you see your um, your partition filters there. So, some more information on the partitioning. Um, on the right side, um, and oh yeah, on the right side we basically see the uh, the, the raw delta log entry um, when a new file a new file is added as part of a transaction. As you can see, um, there is in line three, four, and five. It's basically um, the 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 object for partition values, which contains all the partitioning values that that file belongs to. Um, Usually, if you have a look at the at the delta table, you probably think that um, that the partitions are resolved based on the path and the subfolders and subfolders, but that's actually not the case. Um, so the path could point anywhere. So it's, the only thing that's actually important are those partition values. Okay. Um, for example, if you create a clone, um, the path points to somewhere else, and not necessarily has to contain um, the the folders and the subfolders. But by default, that's the way how your um, your your data files are laid out, just from from for historic reasons. Actually, as it was the same for Hive in the past. Um, what you will also realize is that the actual physical parquet files do not contain the values for um, the, those partitioning columns. So it doesn't really make sense to like if you have a parquet file with one million rows to just sort of sales story, territory key or the sales state one million times with the same value. So it was just omitted there and is only available from, from the Delta log. And obviously the, the engine, the, the Delta engine or the reader has to pick up the value from there. Um, another thing that may be slightly different to, to other processing engine is that um, you don't have to specify all the partitioning columns sequentially. So if you have, um, let's say five partitioning columns, um, you don't need to specify them all. You can just also just only specify the latest. As it is resolved in the delta log only, it just uses your um, your partition filter predicates to filter the delta log and then retrieve the files that that still match your um, your filters. Um, I mentioned it. So um, Delta Lake also works for streaming. Um, it can be used as a source and also as a target. Um, even though it's not really um, streaming, it's more like micro patches as as is actual Spark structure streaming. It's also micro patches, and um, the lowest granularity that we can actually stream um, is a file or well, a part of a file. If you, for example, have a parquet okay file, and um, when you're reading from um, from a Delta Lake table in a stream, um, the files are actually processed in order, first in order of the uh, of the version, obviously, and within that version. Um, um, if one one transaction creates multiple files, you will see this um, the physical files having part minus zero 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 one zero zero two, and that's actually the number in which um, in which um, or the order in which they are they are processed in a stream from that table. Um, to make streaming possible and to to basically um, save the state of 
of what has already been processed, so-called um, checkpoints um, need to be created, not to be confused with the, with the checkpoint files in the Delta log. Um, you, are, you always need one checkpoint per source, and you can technically also stream from the same source multiple times if you use different um, checkpoints. Yeah, um, when you do streaming and you need to use merge, uh, merge is only available in, in the for each batch um, command, so you cannot stream or yeah, it doesn't make sense to stream like each individual row and run a merge statement for each. So um, what you actually need to do is to um, run the merge as part of this for each batch function. Um, what's, what you need to watch out is um, the size of, of your trigger and of your batch. So how many, um, well, how much data you actually read in one batch. This can be controlled with, um, with two, um, with mainly two um, properties when you start a stream, which is max, max bytes per trigger and um, max files per trigger. Um, there is um, there are different triggers that you can use. One of them is trigger once, which actually you should avoid because it processes everything in one big batch, which is definitely not what you want because it's very likely causing an out of memory if you, if you um, stream initially from a big table. So there is another one which is called trigger available now, which um, which trigger uh, which which creates batches in the size that you specify. So trigger once ignores um, this max files per trigger and max um, bytes per trigger. And yeah, you can basically um, stop and resume a stream at any time. So we have a scenario at one of our customers where we have basically um, implemented a streaming architecture, but it's not 24 seven running, but we just um, start the pipeline every every now and then, like once a day, process everything that, that has been accumulated until um, or since the previous execution processes it and and then we stop stop the pipeline again because it's just more um, cost efficient and we don't need to have real time data. Um, Delta Lake table properties. Um, um, you can you can use properties in in on on a Delta Lake table directly or also in the Spark um, context to control how Delta works. There are some, um, some yeah, more important ones and some that yeah, I'm not mentioning and we'll see them on the next slide. Um, what's important though is that um, as you can specify them on different levels um, to know which ones are actually used and in this case if you have specified um, a, a delta a property on the delta table itself, and you also have configured um, your Spark setting, the setting on from your execution from from the execution context will always override what you have specified on the table property. Okay. But the, these are just some um, important table properties that you should know um, if you want to know the details. Um, you can just simply Google them or um, can look them up in the references that I'll, I'll show you afterwards. And um, if you want to uh, make your, uh, especially your data management and your delta links very efficient, um, I usually recommend to um, always run the, the commands like an optimize or a, a vacuum as the defaults and specify the exceptions on a table level. So for example, if I want to um, have a table set to um, to delete files older than three days, ex um, um, and not the default of seven days, I can just specify that exception on that table and just run a vacuum um, command on that table, and then um, it will just um, use the default for or the, the the setting from the table. And if I run the vacuum on another table which doesn't have the table property defined, it will just use the default of seven. Um, changing any of the table properties is also um, locked in the delta log. Okay, so let's come to the to the conclusion of my session and the takeaways. Um, so delta lake can obviously solve a lot of problems, especially when it comes to um, to data management um, in terms of of updating and merging data and and um, doing um, ETL and data pipelines. Um, however, um, due to the nature of the Delta log and and how um, how it handles versions and, and, and data files, 
file management is super crucial um, because as, as we've seen, each transaction can potentially create um, new files. And if, for example, if you run an optimize on the whole table, it will actually, um, at least in the first run, duplicate the whole table physically. Um, so um, data maintenance, maintenance jobs are absolutely mandatory. So you should have a vacuum job or an optim, or more important is the vacuum job, I guess, um, scheduled on a, on, a, on a regular basis, like daily ideally, or maybe even um, weekly or, or monthly, if, it, if that also works for you, um, you just need to check. But you should definitely have some in place. And um, as I just mentioned before, um, use table properties to manage the, um, the different settings um, of your Delta Lake tables. If you uh, want to have a look on the on the on the internals and on more details on the Delta um, Delta Lake log protocol and Delta internals of Delta Lake itself, there are some very good links that basically describe what what's happening underneath and, for example, what what table properties um, you can use and what they actually do. So these are so just two very very important um, um, resources and references. And yeah, that's it. Um, thank you from my side um, for, for having you in my session. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you have all my contact details in the, in, the, in the first slides. So just drop me an email or ping me on, on Twitter if you need anything. Thank you.